I feel as though there needs to be this communal lowering of expectation levels now, okay? <laughs> <coughs> I'm the... <laughs> Thank you. I'm, <laughs> I'm the poor neurotypical sucker they got to book after Temple Grandin. <laughs> I, my learning curve after 27 years of working with kids on the spectrum is still extremely steep um, and for the past 18 years I've been working in a mainstream secondary school in a, in a specialist resource. I absolutely adore working alongside kids that are different and creative and challenging uh, and I drive to work with a huge smile on my face now. Um, the title of this talk was about getting it right in mainstream secondary education. I very quickly changed that to trying to get it right. Um, Secondary schools are tough places, uh, but I love working in the field of autism. I find it relatively easy to work in the field of autism simply because there is still so much to do and we've got so far to go. Um, the stories that inspired me in a perverse kind of way were autistic adults writing about their times in secondary schools, their time in, in their own secondary education, mainstream schools, and at worst, those stories were, 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 were horror stories. They were times of survival or of hiding away or of being teased or bullied or of non-attendance. And at best, they were stories where one or two teachers made, made a difference. When I was given this opportunity to open a resource, I suppose I had my chance to rewrite some of those stories and to look at some of the outcomes that Temple was talk talking about that go, that go beyond the, the age of school, secondary schools as well. I think I always picture in my mind parents and professionals 30 years down the line when they look back on what we've done there may be some laughter and there may be some surprise in the approaches that we had but what they mustn't be able to do in the future is look back on what we did and question our effort and our determination and our drive to push the barriers back even further. So, 10 factors of importance to me, no particular order. I do sometimes shoot from the hip, so if I, if I upset anybody. Uh, I've worked in specialist schools before I, I, I went into mainstream secondary education, so I'm, uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of specialist schools as well. When Temple talks about that range of provision that's needed, uh, then that includes specialist provision as well. So, First factor of importance was I just landed this job 18 years ago. It was just a massive stroke of luck for me. Um, the, 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 the school, King Egbert School, has got 1,400 pupils on roll. It includes a sixth form. It's a culturally very diverse school. Um, and I hadn't stepped foot in a mainstream secondary school since I'd been a kid there myself. So I started in this school with the first two pupils, Sean and Andrew. And we were literally, we hadn't got a clue. We were like, we were rabbits caught in the headlights. Uh, we didn't know what we were doing or where to go. And worse, the, 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 the staff and the pupils at school, at King Egbert School, hadn't been prepared. We landed there literally just because there was some space. They hadn't had any say in us going there. They hadn't had any choice. They hadn't had any training. Um, and we were easy targets. Um, let's be straight, if you put 1,400 teenagers in one building and expect good learning and good behaviour to be two of the outcomes, it's ambitious to say the least, <laughs> during the teenage bit. Um, secondary schools are tough places and Ofsted's made them tougher. The government is, has got this very strong keenness that it's had over the past 10 and 15 years on just focusing on academic results. Uh, and less on personalised education and guidance for pupils. So, me and Sean and Andrew decided that we would just go and try everything in this school. We would go to every single lesson. Uh, and I joined in. I, when we were in technology, my tongue and groove joints were literally pulled apart by the technology teacher. My egg salad was marked as poor. And uh, don't get me start, my French accent was just nowhere. We, I went to every meeting that I could possibly get into, whether it was year team or departments or pastoral meetings, and every time I walked into a meeting, the kind of room fell silent because they, they didn't know what to do with me and I didn't know what to do with them. The main person who seemed to be, if you like, in charge of this silent opposition was the head of sixth form, and at the time it was a very exclusive sixth form. It was just for A-level students. Um, she was called Mrs Smith. Uh, I've made that up, just in case. Um, and it, me and Sean and Andrew decided communally that we would target Mrs Smith with good mornings and good afternoons, and we would go out of our way to make her feel 
valued, um, even though she wasn't reciprocating. Sean took this many, many stages further. <laughs> and after a couple of weeks, he knew what her husband's job was, where her children were at university, what they were having for dinner on Sunday, the next holiday they were planning in the summertime. And after a couple of weeks of being bombarded with this, Mrs. Smith came and knocked on our door, which was the first time she came into our base, uh, and said, Mr. Matthew, your children remind me of old-fashioned children. They're so polite and so well-mannered. I think things will be okay from now on. And they were. Doors started to open. She started to help. And it was down to Sean and Andrew and a bit of luck. The other bit of luck that we got after the first two pupils, the parents seemed to want to send their children to us, which, which was really, really lucky. Um, and there's, there's, there's lots of things happen when you go massively over numbers in the way that we have over the past 18 years. First of all, you learn more and more about autism. Uh, and secondly, the school has to change. Ofsted have a separate category for recognising the efforts and progress of pupils who are statemented. So suddenly, if you've got 35 kids on the spectrum in a school, management want to make things happen for you. They want to help. They want to make the school, if you like, more autism friendly, which is wonderful for me. The second thing that happens is that parents of other children on the spectrum who don't necessarily want the integrated resource in the school want the school. They perceive with some justification that that King Egbert school is a more autism friendly school than the secondary school down the road. So we've probably got more kids on the spectrum in our mainstream secondary school than most other schools in the country, which is fantastic. It's taken to the nth degree. So a couple of years ago, we had a family move over from Paris with their severely autistic son just to get into the school, not the resource. It's wonderful for me because it keeps my learning curve in the, in the upward direction. The second factor that I've realised is very important is, uh, is making these mistakes. Uh, our cognitive ability range of the 35 pupils goes from, if you like, at the end of Key Stage 4, children who will do very few GCSEs, maybe not do any GCSEs but have taken a more vocational route, to, at the moment, three pupils who we have in the sixth form. So a massive spread of ability. There are certainly children in our integrated resource who could have just as comfortably, just as easily, maybe just as appropriately, or maybe more appropriately, been placed in a specialist school. The social ability of those 35 pupils as well, massive spread from kids that want to get out there and mix uh, and, and interact with their neurotypical peers, to kids that are, are, are more self-contained and are happy with who they are. When we talk to the other children in schools, we've got 35 kids on the spectrum, there's lots more neurotypical kids, we use this very simple analogy of taking them and plonking them in the middle of a foreign country where they wouldn't understand the language, they wouldn't understand what was expected of them, and we try and get them to talk about how they would feel, their feelings of anger, of fear, of anxiety, of depression perhaps. Um, so we, we, we push this idea of autism being if you like, a, 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 a different culture to the neurotypical culture. It's not, it's not a massively new idea anymore, is it? Um, if you like, one of my friends, Richard Exley, calls it taking the diss out of disability, which uh, it, 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 it sticks in my mind. If you're dealing with two cultures, our neurotypical culture, the 99 out of 100, and the autism culture, the 1 in 100, mistakes are going to be inevitable. And after the first couple of years of making mistakes every day, we stopped kind of beating ourselves up about it and just realised that it's two different cultures. So autistic children are going to make mistakes and the neurotypical adults are going to make hundreds, thousands of mistakes. And there is a beauty about it as long as nobody gets hurt. Um, the physical base that we've got in our school is the place to make mistakes. It's a place to come back to when you're wounded and you need help and whether you're a neurotypical member of staff or whether you're an autistic child. It's the place where we can be supportive to each other and we can make mistakes in the base. You want to study the different range of light bulbs that Tesco sells for the thousandth time that term, then the resource is where you're going to do that. And nobody's going to moan at you, it's part of who you are. It's very difficult to keep mistakes in one place in, the, in our resource base. 
So very early on when I was supporting Sean in a, in a, in a maths lesson, I sh Sean, uh, very early on, when he started his secondary education, came from a specialist primary school, uh, became very strongly interested in bold men. Uh, and, bold, and, and we studied bold men in our resource base at lunchtime and in some of the withdrawal lessons that he had. So we looked at great bold sportsmen and great bold men of history and, and we, we thought we'd kind of, it was good, it was good and we learned so much. In the maths lesson on a Friday afternoon, Sean put up his hand and it was the first time he'd ever put up his hand in a maths lesson so I was really impressed. And his comment to the maths teacher was that he thought his bowl patch had got slightly bigger since last week's lesson. <laughs> the other kids thought that was wonderful. No more maths work done in that lesson uh, whatsoever. <laughs> hey, for Sean, it was just an observation, but it, was, you know, it, led to, it led to further learning that you can only talk about bowl men uh, in the resource base. Um, <clears throat> it's, uh, yeah, he never ceases to amaze. Autism has an extremely high profile in our school. It has to. It isn't, it isn't hidden away. It can't be hidden away. Uh, and whenever possible, we enter into uh, kind of counselling sessions, if you like, with our individuals on a one-to-one -one basis about their autism. Uh, I would say about 80% of our kids in the resource um, enjoy who they are. They celebrate who they are. They, and they see that autism is part of who they are. And that is a, a cause for celebration. The other 20% of kids in the resource are going to have a tougher journey. If they could have their, let's, let's not make any bones about it, if, if they could have their autism surgically removed tomorrow, they would choose to do so. I have a particularly vocal and, and, and noisy year seven pupil who started last September who, whose basic message to us is, get me out of the scrapes that I'll get into. Don't be offended if I call you names or spit at you or, or take my clothes off in the middle of a corridor. And by the way, never ever talk to me about my Asperger's syndrome. Now, as a neurotypical, I can't do that. Uh, and I'm sure his parents wouldn't want me to do it either. I just have to hope that when he's made the tenth mistake in that day, maybe there'll be an opportunity for me to put some support in and some guidance in whenever he's ready in the next five years. But I'm not going to rush him. Mistakes made by other people are, are, are just as forgivable through lack of knowledge and lack of adjustment. To just, there's, there's so much unawareness out there still. We know that. When one of my friends went for an operation uh, at hospital, he was about year nine, year ten, because he was walking on his tiptoes, so over the years his Achilles tendons had, 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 had not, they'd shrunk. Um, and he'd gone for an operation to have them lengthened so that he could then have physiotherapy and walk with his, with his heels on the floor. Uh, the surgeon wasn't ready. He, they all got to the hospital. Him and his mum were kept waiting for an hour. He couldn't take the pre-med because it was a tablet. They weren't prepared. But what the beauty of that surgeon was that he took a phone call from me after they failed to do the operation. Um, and I was allowed to go the next time he went for his operation with mum. And when we got to the hospital, I've never seen the syringe full of kind of horse medicine that they kind of got down his throat at the start to calm him down. Uh, and so that when we got into the pre-op, whereas before he didn't want the cannula in the back of his hand, by the time we got into pre-op, he, he wouldn't have cared where the cannula went. He really, he really didn't mind. It could have gone anywhere. Um, I spent the first nine years of my, life, of my career in specialist schools, um, and then the last 18 years in mainstream. I think the first nine years I started to build this framework of knowledge about autism, like we all do. Uh, and I, spent, I think I spent the last 18 years kind of dismantling that and, and just learning about every new kid that walks through the door. Um, I, I, and I think the more I learn about autism, the more I think the very essence of it is that they're more individual than neurotypicals. Um, and I don't know about you, but when, when, I'm, when I'm learning about another culture, I, I tend to watch more and I tend to listen more. I tend to carefully negotiate and compromise rather than instruct or teach or tell. Uh, and, and it's very hard to attract people into a job because it's much easier to tell and instruct and be in charge. It's, it's, it's much more difficult to take, the, 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 for me, the more holistic approach. Um, the, the, the kids with autism that I work with across the board, if you get it right, they have to become not only anthropologists in their own individual brand of autism, but they have to become, with our support and guidance, anthropologists in our neurotypical world as well. They have, to, they have to go on far more complex journeys than neurotypical teenagers. 
Um, it's much, much harder to, 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 it's easy to say, but harder to do. We have to learn about every new child that walks through the door in, in school. Uh, and, and initially, if that means because their anxiety levels are going to be very high, if that means, I might slightly disagree with Temple here, that means at the start, us taking away lots of pressure, of reducing anxieties, then, then we'll do that. Um, so if I have a pupil that is getting anxious after lunch about packing things back into his bag when he first starts, then I'll do the packing for him. If, if I have a pupil that's anxious about homework, then I'll organise the homework schedule and contact mum. We'll have a traffic light system for how far parents need to get involved in supporting that way. So if it's green, let the kid get on with it. If it's amber, you might need to chip in. If it's red, you'll sit right next to him while he does it. Um, I know that over the five years that I'm going to have those kids, gradually, when the time's right, I'm going to pass those responsibilities back over, bit by bit, to build that independence. Um, but I don't have to do it all at once. I'm, I'm very lucky to have those five years. Um, the transition visits for our pupils that start in, in Year 7 this coming September, they've already been half a dozen times. We've done the treasure hunts around school. We've had an own, our own little science lesson for them and a little maths lesson for them. They've taken photographs of everything to build their kind of uh, preparation book for over the summer holidays. Um, it sounds easy, but you have to convince so many other neurotypical people to go on the journey with you. Um, and, and, and they're not always kind of reluctant. They're not always willing participants, are they? Sometimes you have to, we'll get onto that. So, point number four is, um, I, I'm so lucky. I, I really am lucky with the people I work with. Again, I, 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 18 years down the line, when we, when we, on the rare occasions we do have a job advertised, I've got people queuing down the street to come and work with us because, I, the people who I work with just want to work with autistic teenagers. They don't want to do anything else. Um, as a manager, I'm, I'm privileged to work alongside them. They push me out to fight the battles, and they're there to kind of pick up the pieces when, when, I, when I get beaten up uh, and have to come back and, and get looked after. I've got one other teacher, uh, and I've got the equivalent of 10 learning support assistants. For me... <laughs> until I change the amount of money, or we change the amount of money that the bulk of the people in this profession who, who, who work in this profession get paid, like learning support assistance, then nothing will get that much better. Um, the, the, the wage that they take home is an insult. Uh, it's not a living wage, and I, I, I'm continually ashamed as a manager at the amount of effort and work and professionalism that I expect from them and that they deliver. So maybe I agree slightly with the Minister of Education. I don't very often agree with the Minister of Education, but perhaps academy status will help to change that. And there are certainly a couple of schools in Sheffield that have gone academy that are already beginning to pay those very skilled professionals the money that they deserve, or certainly more money. Um, our interview process, we go on gut feelings. We kind of fill in the tick sheet that Human Resources wants us to fill in as well and uh, make up some scores. But we go on gut feelings. If there's somebody comes to interview that's got lovely, beautiful set answers, they're probably not going to get the job. If they come and they're open and they're willing to learn and they're willing to watch and listen and, and join in, fantastic, then we'll give them a go. Staff tell me that the first year in post is a nightmare and there are tears and there are tantrums um, and they have to see well, first of all, they have to have permission from me to make mistakes. So as soon as people start, you give them that permission. Again, going back to those mistakes that we're going to make. More importantly, staff have got to see me working with autistic youngsters in lessons and in the resource base so that they can see my mistakes day after day, week after week, uh, year after year. Um, I think that I, I am very lucky in that they're a strong bunch of people. And if I become complacent, they're the first people to kick me. Uh, and, and so they should be. Um, oh, goodness. Um, we place two or three autistic kids in a, in a form, and we have seven, for, uh, seven form entry, so seven classes of kind of 30 kids that come in every September. We have to get to each of those seven forms to begin the process of sharing information about autism with those neurotypical teenagers. My two or three kids get a choice as to whether they attend that tutorial or not. 
it's more interesting when they choose to, to attend, but probably more pressure on me and my colleague. Um, we, play, we, we, we play games that highlight the fact that we all have some communication difficulties. Uh, we, we play um, word throws, so to get across the idea of processing language. We'll have a, a, a sentence of words on a, on a card, cut into individual words. The sentence might be, stand behind your chair and put your fingers in your ears. So you have those words in your pocket and you explain about processing time of language and then you throw these words at some poor unsuspecting year seven pupil who tries to catch them. And the words that they catch from the sentence they can use to formulate that sentence, the ones they drop, they can't. So you end up with kids sticking fingers in everywhere and, and standing on chairs and it degenerates. But it gets across that idea, that, 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 that processing time. Teachers, um, Teachers take a little longer to get the messages than kids do because, they, <laughs> because they're under pressure. No, don't, no, they're under pressure to get results and they're also credit to them. I, di I didn't realise how hard teachers worked until I stepped into mainstream secondary school. They, they, they also have a passion about this subject, or the best teachers do anyway, which I'm, I'm, I'm fortunate to work in a school that's full of very good teachers. So they don't like it when kids miss out on their lessons. Now, we, on, we go to about 70%, maybe 80% of lessons. At Key Stage 4, we don't choose a whole range of GCSE subjects, even for our brightest pupils. So to go to the geography teacher and say, I'm sorry, you know, little Johnny's not going to do your subject this year. You might come back to it next year, but it's hard. And in the first four or five years of being there, they weren't ready to listen to anything that I said. And actually, I hadn't got anything to say that was useful in any case. After four or five years, we sat them down and we did some proper training with them because they were ready, they wanted to know more, and we had one or two things to tell them. And we sat 100 teachers in a, in a kind of a formal setting in the hall, tables and chairs, and we gave them some paper. And uh, some of my team were sat in, the, in, in with the teachers. And the task was to fold this piece of paper with instructions from the front, fold this piece of paper to make a swan, an origami bird. My members of the team already knew exactly how to make the origami bird. And we videoed this from the front. Uh, and the instructions from the front were given half in English and half in Welsh. And the look of confusion on their teachers' faces and the fact that some of them started to mess about. So it gave me a chance to get my own back on that technology teacher that pulled my tongue and groove joint apart. Uh, <laughs> sent him out for a while. Um, <laughs> and uh, it... it it helped them to understand and then we could hit them with some messages as well as saying what could we do to improve our support work for you and, and it started that process. Now any new teacher that steps into our school, any new member of staff, support staff gets training from us first as part of their induction programme. Dinner staff, admin staff are photographs of our kids up on the wall. We introduce our children to the cook, you know, the cooks and the dinner ladies so that they know um, who they are. Management's the easiest group, because if, if, if uh, again, let's, not, let's, be, let's be straight. If I've got me, one of the teacher, and, twelve, and, and ten learning support assistants, I should turn out very good results. I should turn out kids that at year seven are predicted in their whatever tests they're called now, CAT tests, they're predicted to get a pile of D grades at GCSE. I should be turning that kid out to get a pile of C grades at GCSE. But I've got the staff to do that, and I'm in a good school. So management think that's wonderful. They think that's fantastic. And what that means is they leave you alone to get on with the really important stuff, which is like the life skills, the communication skills, and having fun. We have to fit in all that a specialist school does in maybe three, three and a half, four hours a week when we're in our resource base. And it's very, very important to have fun. Um, We, we, are, we are rock violas. There, there's, there's, there's no doubt in my mind that, um, that, we, that we speak out with the whole force of our personality. Um, parents already know that, that, that you have to fight to get what you want and you have to fight to improve services and sometimes even get appropriate services. Um, Steve Ladyman, a few years ago, when he was chair of the All Party Group um, on, on Autism, I think called Parents of Autistic Children, the, is it the bare-knuckle, two-fisted street fighters of the disability movement. <laughs> Absolutely, I'm spot on. And unless professionals are standing there shoulder to shoulder with parents when they're going through those hard times, then, then we've got no to come, have we? We need to be there. 
and we need to shoot from the hip. Um, there's a whole host of outcomes that um, you would wish for in terms of your ch passing your children on into adulthood. As Ros Blackman says, we're adults for a lot longer than we are children. It could be better leisure activities, great supported living, fantastic uh, support from whatever benefits are needed, uh, relationship counselling, continued life skills stuff in adulthood. We chose to focus on employment. It is fair to say that people with autism in this country are very underrepresented in the employment market and we wanted to do something about that. We were horrified because it made us reflect on our practice in school and if we were preparing these children for maybe an 85, 86% chance of being unemployed when they're adults, what were we doing? What was that investment for at this stage? So we looked for work experience and we looked for it before the traditional idea of doing it in year 10 and we looked for a longer period of just two weeks out of one year. We looked for a morning or an afternoon every week from year nine. And uh, me and Andrew started at Sainsbury's uh, on fruit and veg. Uh, his displays of bananas were works of art. Uh, woe betide any customer that took a bunch of bananas <laughs> away. That, that wasn't part of the deal. It led to so much learning for us, as well as independent travel back and from, back, back to, from Sainsbury's to school. Um, Sainsbury's became a, a large part of Andrew's life. Um, we wanted to go further. We set up a charity that now runs, has been running for 12 or 13 years in Sheffield. And, and my colleagues in that charity, their job is just to find paid work for autistic adults. Not just who came through King Egbert's, that would be, that would be very uh, unfair. But any autistic adult in Sheffield. And they, they fix up work experience placements and get people into paid work. But I, and that's two full-time staff and two part-time staff that I have to find, we have to find the money for every year. For me, that money should come from government because for me, I'm turning out, I, we are turning out more autistic adults that are paying tax, claiming appropriately lower levels of benefit. I just want some of that saving back. But I haven't got the year of government like, for example, a National Autistic Society has. We have to be this role model. Uh, we have to, I have to have staff who are calm, level-headed, uh, wonderful neurotypicals. If I was plonked in that foreign culture myself, I would want the best guides, the best interpreters, the best negotiators. That's what I would want. Never easy on a Friday afternoon after a tough week when all you're thinking about is that, is that first gin and tonic. Um, my pupils tell me that I raise my voice on average two or three times a year. There are, there are some pupils that will not realise that I'm being cross on those rare occasions that I am cross, so I will give them a warning first. I will tell them how my body language and my voice is going to change, else they probably would just laugh. Um, um, I, I have to work with staff who can keep calm, no matter how many kids are having a meltdown or how many kids have run off that day, uh, or how many kids just don't simply want the summer holidays to start because They'd, they'd, they'd rather stay at school. Um, and then to get home and do the next bid for a charity or to fill in the next stupid piece of paper that the local authority wants or the next annual review or the next IEP, it's hard on family life. That's hard on family life. With, and I appreciate how challenging it must be to be a parent sometimes, but it's hard for professionals as well. My wife and my two daughters, were, they, they, they didn't want to become autism anoraks. I think they've been, they've, they've been forced. They've not been willing participants on the journey. They've, uh, they've very much been led by me, and I, I'm, I'm constantly amazed that they, uh, they continue to put up with me. Um, oh, goodness, we are zipping through this, but it's great. Um, I think creativeness and craftiness is, is fantastic. I think as I've gone along in the 18 years that I've been in mainstream, you, you, you do make slightly fewer mistakes, I'm glad to say. For those of you who have made more than 50 mistakes this week. It, do, it, 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 it does get better sometimes. We were on a particularly arduous sponsored walk a couple of years ago. Uh, 40 miles this school does around the beautiful countryside in, uh, in North Derbyshire. And uh, one of my friends, Sinead, who's a little overweight, a little out of condition, was, was on her last couple of miles. And I could see her in the distance coming down the hill. Uh, with one of my colleagues who was kind of carrying the bag of sweets next to Sinead and <laughs> encouraging them. And I, de I decided to stop and wait for them because uh, I hadn't seen Sinead that day. Um, and when they approached, Sinead came up to me and she, and she leaned very heavily on my 
shoulder and, and whispered in my ear, Mr. Matthew, I love you. Not in a sexual way. <laughs> but just because you're in the right place at the right time. And I think in the, it, with that experience and of being in the field of working with that culture of autism, you do find yourself more and more in the right place at the right time. Oh, goodness. The, 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 um, the parents who want their kids to come to our provision take a risk. And I tell them that every year. I wish some of them would stop doing it. But they, 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 they keep sending their kids. But I make it clear that it is a risk. Secondary schools are very, very tough places to be. Um, the, the, the parents are hugely supportive to us. When we make mistakes, they forgive us, and that's crucial. Um, uh, you know, we don't make huge, you know, nobody's got hurt, honestly, in 18 years, seriously. Um, when we've got creative ideas, or when any member of staff has a new idea, a new approach, if it's discussed in a team and discussed with parents, by and large, we'll go for it, however different it may seem to the, the neurotypical world. Um, even if, that, even if it doesn't benefit that pupil, we've, we've, we've crossed it off the list, if you like. So you, the, 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 you can't work in an atmosphere of fear. It has to be creative and positive uh, and rewarding as well. And I think the resources, are, it, you, you, always have, you have to listen to that pupil voice. Um, we, have a, we have mainstream kids come in every day uh, at lunchtime. So we have our autistic children or some of them, some neurotypical kids. And, and my kids, if you like, got together one day, a couple of years ago, and said that for one lunchtime each week, they just want it for the autistic kids. And, and I think that was fair enough. So on Thursdays, Thursdays is a great day because it's just our kids in the base at lunchtime and not hordes of mainstream kids who seem to like coming in as well. Um, typical game on a Friday afternoon at the moment, listening to a pupil's voice and how useful that is and how imperative it is, Typical game on a Friday afternoon at the moment for some of my year 10s who seem to be in there all Friday afternoon, which is, I must look into actually, um, is a, is a card, they've got a card game and it's like a scenario game. And it's funny and, it, and it's filthy and it's very teenager based. And it's kind of, what would you rather? You know, I don't know, find a pubic hair in your, in your hot chocolate or a maggot in your muesli. And they, and they discuss it with a, with a member of staff. Um, I don't know. They have a vote sometimes, I don't know. <laughs> uh, the, um, Matthias never joins in with this. Matthias comes from a very strong Baptist family uh, and considers this game, or has considered this game, a, a little bit risque. And then, a couple of weeks ago, my colleague was telling me that Matthias blew them all away. There were three or four year tens playing with his colleague and Matthias was sat probably doing some work because he, he thinks if he's not working, it's not worthwhile. Um, and Matthias came over and sat with them and he said, I've made up my own card. Um, and it's fantastic, that's great, what a great idea, you know, we can all make up our own ideas. And Matthias' uh, either or was, um, would you rather be the ugliest person in the world but have unlimited consensual sex? <laughs> or the most beautiful person in the world but never get to kiss anybody ever? Now my colleague tells me that the debate that followed that, <laughs> unbelievable, wouldn't have been out of place in kind of Oxford debating society. What it did for my colleague was, was, was <coughs> encourage her even more to give Matthias some time, some one-to-one -one time, because he needed to talk about that religious aspect of his, his spiritual life, but actually his overriding desire to have a girlfriend and how those two things were, were slightly in conflict. So um, the work is ongoing and underlines some simple, these simple common sense, common sense truths that you've got to listen to kids. And, and building relationships is, is the most important thing. Final slide. Um, my, 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 t my other teacher, who's been with me for, for four years now, um, used to be, in, in his previous teaching life, used to be a, a modern foreign language teacher, French and German. Had a fantastic career as a parent as well of a, of a young man with, uh, with Asperger's syndrome. And he tells me that he looks back with some fondness when he was a German and French teacher because the stresses of the job were that he had piles of books to mark at home and schemes of work to do and, and lesson plans to do. But when he'd finished them, he was done. 
and he switched off instantly. He put it to one side. Now, four years of working with me, and he's a little bit cross with me, because he can't do that anymore. The dividing line between his week and his weekend is not so clear. He hasn't got those books to mark, but he can have ideas in a holiday time, and he insists on phoning me when he has the ideas. <laughs> um, and, and so, <laughs> It, it, those ideas can strike at any time, day or night. I, for me, I could have been a maths teacher. That was, my, that was one of my desires, apart from being a lorry driver, a maths teacher. And I could have been marking those books. And I could have then switched off and spent real quality time with the people who, who hang on in there with me. Um, but you know what? I'd rather drive to work next week with that smile on my face still. And for me, it's a no-brainer because in, in holiday time and at weekends and at five o'clock in the morning, that's when I have some of my best ideas. Thanks very much for listening. Thank you.